wanted to say a few words about my organization, UKTI, here at the British Consulate. So we are the foreign commercial arm of the British government, the business development arm of the government, if you will. We have two purposes in life. One is helping British firms export their businesses and services to overseas markets. And the other is probably more relevant for people in this room, which is helping foreign companies, in this case, US firms, invest in the UK. And the way that we do that is, as a government department, we work with our regulator in financial services, providing access to firms um, who need to speak with regulators about different uh, you know, registration issues or product development issues that they're considering. We work with UK Visas and Immigration to help you sort out the visas to get your people operational in the UK. And then all the practicalities of being up and running in terms of you know, getting a company registered, finding the right office space, employing the right people, looking at the benefits landscape for your employees in the UK, pretty much risk managing all of the internationalization processes that you need to go through when you think about investing overseas. And that's why we exist as an organization. All of our services are free and confidential, and um, success for us is when interesting, um, disruptive US firms are able to translate their ideas to the, to the UK and be successful doing that. Um, and so when you think about internationalization, our message is think about the UK. When you think about the UK, think about UKTI. We're certainly here to help. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the CEO of Hedgeable, Mike Kane. Thank you. First of all, I wanted to thank our gracious hosts uh, for having us today. Um, you know, this is the first in a, a many part series uh, that we're doing on Bitcoin, so this is an awesome turnout. So everybody give yourself a round of applause here for coming out today. Uh, so uh, we're gonna have an all-star panel here in about five minutes. Uh, first, I wanna give a little bit of background on myself, Hedgeable, and you're probably asking yourself why in the world are are you guys having this at this venue? Um, so to, to, to get started, you know, Hedgeable is about uh, democratizing sophisticated investing. So I started the firm uh, with my brother, Matt. Uh, this guy looks just like me in the front here. And we're twins, by the way. Yeah, he's much better looking than I am. Uh, so we started the firm in 2009, really at the height of the financial crisis. Uh, if you look back at that time, there was trillions of dollars in, in wealth that was lost by the average American, and the, the average wealthy person in the U.S. lost about half as much. In fact, it was 40% versus less than 20% for wealthy investors. And we said, you know, this is ridiculous. Why do people with 50 million bucks get these awesome products? And like Bitcoin, which we'll get into in a few minutes, but if you have 5,000, 50,000, the average person in the U.S. has $47,000 in an IRA, they're not getting access to the same kind of product that a wealthy person is. And the wealth gap in the US just grows and grows and grows. Um, so you know, we've been interested in Bitcoin for a long time. Uh, in fact, I should announce tonight that we're now the first company to invest clients directly in Bitcoin. So if you're a retail client uh, with an IRA account, we have a free service. You could come to us and as part of your portfolio, we actually are now working with Coinbase uh, out in Silicon Valley, uh, and we're just launching this this week. We come right on our platform and invest in Bitcoin because you know, we feel, feel that Bitcoin is the future, uh, not only of the world, but of finance. Uh, it's a great investment. Uh, so really the topic of this uh, first uh, panel conversation is investing in Bitcoin. And we found there's really a lack of education in the market in general. There's a lot of you know, tech forums and things that are more on the technical side, but Looking at the opportunity you know, economically, philosophically, and from an investing perspective, we think there's a huge need for education. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce our panel. Um, first, we have, we'll go left to right here. Now we have Aaron Zerker. Uh, so Aaron is the CEO and co-founder of the cryptocurrency analytics company. Uh, so what they do is they provide multi-exchange cryptocurrency uh, trading services and investment analytics on cryptocurrencies. Uh, he, in fact, just launched the company in July of 2013. Is that right? Yep. Uh, and then we have uh, to his right and to your left, uh, Trace Mayer. Um, so we're very pri privileged to have uh, Trace here. He's an entrepreneur. Um, a lot of you might know he's an angel investor. 
a journalist in the Bitcoin space. Uh, he was uh, among the first popular bloggers to publicly recommend Bitcoin uh, in its infancy, in fact, around 25 cents, right? So you guys can do the math. Uh, he hosts a, a Bitcoin knowledge podcast, by the way. Uh, it's called Bitcoin.kn. Uh, so any of you guys can subscribe to that uh, on iTunes uh, once you're out of the, the uh, discussion tonight. Uh, to his right, we have uh, Elizabeth Ritter, who's actually traveled the furthest to come up here from Washington, D.C., so very happy to have you, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth is a partner at DLA Piper, um, which is a, a big law firm in the U.S. Uh, formerly, she served as the chief counsel for the CFTC. Uh, during her 25 years at the CFTC, uh, Elizabeth served as counsel to both Republican and Democratic chairs of the agency, uh, including serving as chief of staff and senior legal counsel to the former CFT commissioner, Bart Chilton. Uh, and then to her right, we have uh, Gareth Jones. Uh, so Gareth is representing the UK yes. on this panel. That's yes. Although he's been in the US for, for, for 10 years, right? So you're, yes. Uh, so Gareth is an entrepreneur and business leader who has worked in emerging and high growth financial technology businesses for the last 15 years. Uh, and right now he's the co-founder and general partner of the FinTech Collective, which is a New York-based uh, venture capital platform. So everybody, thank you very much for coming out. So we had a, uh, a presentation and all that good stuff, but I'm going to uh, wing it at this point, and we're going we're gonna to go with it more of a casual style here. Uh, so I broke this panel down into a few sections. Uh, but first, we're going to go through some general Bitcoin knowledge, education. I know there's a lot of people in the room that you know, might not be as familiar as, as others about Bitcoin, so we're going to try to keep things very high level for the first few minutes. Then we're going to spend some time talking about uh, investing opportunities. Uh, that's a hot topic now, given the volatility in Bitcoin's price, and we're going to get feedback from everybody on the panel on, on why that is. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to look at the startup space, um, there's been $400 million put into Bitcoin in the last few years, so that's a hot topic. And then finally, we're going to wrap up with some Q&A. Uh, so just to get... I hope we're going to get to talk about the law of regulation or something. Well, that's all intermixed. Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously, Bitcoin is a, uh, is a legal topic, um, so maybe we should start out, Elizabeth, with you. Um, How, oh, so how, how, is, how is Bitcoin regulated now? Is it regulated? Um, who has the ability to regulate it? And let's say that the U.S. government said tomorrow they wanted to regulate Bitcoin. How do they have the power to do that? The answer is yes. And it's important to do that. Yeah. A lot of people think that this is something that is unregulated territory that is incorrect. There are, we have, we have in the United States, and do we have lawyers in the audience? Okay. So you, if you are in the financial market area, you understand that in the United States we have an unusual financial market regulatory structure that's involved in our CEOs. Sovereigns around the world, there is one central financial market regulators. We don't have that. We have banking regulators, securities regulators, derivatives regulators, and they are separate. In this instance, when we're talking about Bitcoin, you have to look at all of those disparate regulators and see where it falls, see what, who has what jurisdiction over what part of it. The banking regulators have made very clear that Bitcoin is a currency. They have deemed it a virtual currency. Under the Commodity Exchange Act, it is also very clear that under Section 189, I won't go into one or not, the chapter and verse of the sections of the Commodity Exchange Act. It is a commodity. Bitcoin is a commodity. It's also called an excluded commodity because it is a currency. That means that if a derivative on a commodity is traded, the CFTC regulates that. And indeed, this week, the Terra Exchange just started trading swaps on Bitcoin, October 8th. And they had to register as a swaps execution facility complying with 13 core principles. This, this was a year-long process for them to become a registered entity under the Commodity Exchange Act. 
to be able to trade these products. It is not a security. Bitcoin is not a security. It's not a debt security. It's not an equity security. It's not an option. An ownership rights so that it is by an option. It is not an investment contract. A power test. It doesn't you know, gain interest from it from the efforts of others. It's not a security. However, just recently the SEC brought a case against what called Eric Voorhees. And what Mr. Voorhees had done was offered what he called an IPO in two companies. I have to read the names of them because I have trouble pronouncing them. <laughs> Feed Z Birds, the Z, and Satoshi Dice. <laughs> <laughs> and what these, what these companies were, these birds, was he, he called them IPOs and he accepted Bitcoin, the value in investing in these companies, he accepted in Bitcoin. And what you got in exchange for investing in these birds was if you followed Twitter accounts, you got Bitcoin. In Satoshi Dice, it's a gambling entity. You could gamble in Bitcoin and win in Bitcoin. What did the SEC sue for? Had nothing to do with the fact that the value exchange was Bitcoin. It had to do that Mr. Voorhees failed to register under Section 5 of the Anti-Criminal Securities Act. What I read from that as a lawyer is that there is no issue on the SEC's part. They, they said nothing about accepting value in an IPO, purchasing shares in a company. They do have a problem with that company is not registered for some degree. That's a problem. So the next test case would be, have somebody issue an IPO and accept Bitcoin. My guess is the SEC is not going to go on. Then we go to FinCEN. FinCEN in March of 2013, issued what they called interpretive guidance. And the interpretive guidance clarified the application of the Bank Secrecy Act, which defines, of course, what a money services provider is and a money transmitter. And what this interpretive guidance did, and it's, it's very broad, and again, I'm going to read the words because it's a long list. Anybody involved in creating, distributing, maintaining, exchanging, accepting, or transmitting Bitcoin, Creating, distributing, obtaining, exchanging, accepting, transmitting, that's a lot. That's a very broad net. This conceptual guidance was intended to clarify under the Bank Secrecy Act who would be a money transmitter, this subset of MSBs, such that under the MSB rules under the Bank Secrecy Act, Registration, registration, reporting, and record keeping rules were coming into play. So what they did was define users, exchangers, and administrators. Users, they fall out. Exchangers and administrators, under certain circumstances with limited exceptions, they fall in, such that the MSB rules on reporting, record keeping, and registration do come into play. So this is very quickly, can I just because this Certainly. is fascinating. And it's very helpful. Someone's laying it out. Well, and it's what, let me tell you, you need a good, if you're doing this, you need a good lawyer. It's cheap insurance. <laughs> See, I mean, this guy, the, Eric Borges was fined tens of thousands of dollars. And, Where's he living now on the Atlantic in the and correctional he can't, facility? And he, can't, and he can't register yet. No, that's another thing. The Department of Justice is getting very, very interested. We're going to get into that in a minute. And they are indicating <laughs> Let me, let me answer your question. Wait, so uh, just to, uh, you know, Gareth, you know, now we got a, a good, some good feedback on the legal side of things. Does, does that make you any more skittish on investing well, actually, in the Bitcoin just, I just Because I think it would be useful just to understand in real life, as my eight-year-old would say, you know, what does that mean, the money transfer stuff? Does that mean that um, a merchant who accepts Bitcoin I'm, I'm getting needs to getting register who... That's, and I'm getting I mean, it's, that. It's, it's, so I think complexity is... is, in, is they, in March 13th, they issued this 
clarification. Then in, it was June of 14, FinCEN issued a new one. And it was about miners and investors. And miners and investors, they said, we're going to put you on the user side as long as you are mining and investing for your sole, right. your sole purposes. Then you don't fall under that. Maybe to uh, you know take a step back, um, you know Aaron. So we talked about miners and a lot of these terms. But maybe you could walk the audience through you know, what is a miner, what are all these different regulatory bodies, and what does you know, transmitting virtual currency mean, and what is the blockchain and all that good stuff. Uh, sixty seconds. <laughs> that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of stuff within sixty seconds. Um, blockchain is a distributed ledger, so. At its core principle, it is a record of who owns what and when it came to the business. Um, and it's transmitted, and you write to it, and you add, you move your, your portion of the ledger to somebody else through this network of miners. And the miners, what they're doing is they're solving an algorithm that is fairly difficult, it takes power and energy to put in, um, to, to correctly find the solution to this algorithm. And then once you once it once a random miner has found a solution, which takes a very long time, they will be allowed to write a transaction, in, which is to transmit coins from one person to another with their permission. Um, so in this way, it's a distributed network that uh, has very few um, weaknesses, as long as the actual people writing each transaction are kept separate and um, are incentivized by continuing to write good transactions. Um, I'd say it's very simple as I can make. No, that was, that was awesome. Uh, so, you know, with that being said, Trace, you know, are we going to reach a point where there's is this a zero sum game? Uh, is is Bitcoin a zero? Can does Bitcoin coexist with fiat currency, or are they mutually exclusive, or, or not? Or, you know, how, how do you view that? You know, given your economics background. Yeah, so are you, are you, are you this one. Okay. Um, so, at its heart, Bitcoin's a technological <coughs> innovation much like steel or gold or uh, gunpowder or the longbow. And it's our first practical implementation of triple entry bookkeeping, which is a big, big deal. Uh, we had double entry bookkeeping about 600 years ago. With, and, and getting into some of the legal side of this also, at its heart, Bitcoin is just math and just numbers. Uh, you. We, we have prime numbers in math, like one, three, seven. Did you know that it's actually illegal to possess certain prime numbers? Like you can go to jail for, for, for felony, for possessing a particular number, it's called illegal primes. And, no, I'm, I'm not making this up, like it's serious. Like if you, if you possess, if, yeah, and it's important because of encryption, because of, uh, because of how we're able to use these numbers with software code. And in the 1990s, there was uh, a, a string of Supreme Court cases about the crypto wars. And in the crypto wars, under the Munitions Act, it was illegal to export cryptography. Uh, and cryptography is just math. And it got challenged under freedom of speech. And the US Supreme Court and, and Adam Back actually printed out a t-shirt that had the encryption algorithm like on it, and then somebody else printed out a book, and they said, hey look, our encryption is protected by free speech. And the US Supreme Court said, we agree. And they protected encryption under the First Amendment, under freedom of speech. And that laid a foundation for a lot, our entire internet industry that we have, because we have to use SSL and we have to use encryption to make sure that we're able to log into our online banking, to make sure that we have our, our networks, uh, have all these things. Well, Bitcoin is another iteration of the application of encryption. And at its heart, when you're making edits to this global ledger, you have to have a, what's called a private key and the private key is a long number. And you use that number to solve a math problem to transfer Bitcoins from one public key to the other public key. And you, and you can only do that if you can solve the math problem. Like, you can't get a gun out and shoot the Bitcoin network and transfer the Bitcoins. You have to do the math. 
and and so it's really presented in an interesting conundrum from a legal point of view because under the Citizens United case, Justice Scalia said that money is speech, right? But in Bitcoin, it literally is. Like if you have possession of that particular number, you can move or control uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of value. I mean, there's over $100 million in one particular public key. Uh, and Not so, mine, don't get me. And, and everybody can see it. Yeah, it must be yours. <laughs> and, uh, but, but this has big implications. Uh, like, for example, there's a very dangerous intersection between offshore asset protection trusts and bankruptcy. And the 521 uh, contempt power that a judge has in a bankruptcy court. He can actually incarcerate you indefinitely using the contempt power uh, if you don't wire your money back from an offshore asset protection trust. Will, uh, from a criminal procedure standpoint, for the most part, you don't have to disclose a private key because you're protected against self-incrimination under the Fifth Amendment. Well, can you hide a bunch of assets in Bitcoin and not be subject to fraudulent advance, for example? We haven't tested a lot of these, a lot of these issues. So these issues will get tested in court, We'll figure out whether they're protected by First Amendment or not, if against self-incrimination or not. I mean, we don't know, but at its heart, it's this new technological innovation that has wide-ranging implications. And it's the first example where data, where the number itself has actually become the value for the asset. So, uh, Gareth, um, who brings up a lot of good points, you know, recently, Mark Andreessen compare Bitcoin to the internet. Is that the way you see it? Are we at the crossroads where we'll be sitting here 50 years from now and saying, Bitcoin, that, why didn't we see that coming? And we should you know, start the next Facebook and everybody should you know, get out there and start Bitcoin companies because there's a trillion dollar opportunity. Is that the way you view the market? Is it like, is this the, the versioning of the internet 2.0? Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, it's a fascinating topic, especially this guys here actually get yeah, right the leaders. Uh, I think from an investing perspective and, and, and having lived and breathed you know the financial services tech for the entirety of my career which is only 16 years um, I think this is one of the things that you know you see innovation and most of innovation is just incremental innovation and this seems to be something that is just okay stop that and let's rebuild it using this which is you know a fundamental shift and that's Deeply exciting. Um, me personally, and I think, you know, probably speak for my partner as well, um, I think we get more excited around this concept of a distributed ledger, right? I, I don't know if it's going to be Bitcoin or some other virtual currency that ends up being successful. Um, but what I do think, uh, and certainly this is what we're you know, building around our thesis around the deploying capital into this space, is that. The distributed ledger is going, I mean, the, the genie's out of the bottom. I think it's, it's, it, it's going to be a fundamental disruptive force in financial services for, for many years to come. So um, we've seen a bunch of companies over the last two years. We've actually only made one investment um, in a business called Trade Block. Um, we were based here in New York. And I think what fascinated us about that particular, this is two brothers of 28, um, and one of them was a former fixed income trader at City, and his brother had been building missiles for Raytheon and DC. And both had been hobbyists in the Bitcoin community for three years, so five years old. Um, so just by being hobbyists, they had a lot more domain expertise than many others in, in the world space, and they they had that deep technical background with one of the brothers, and also this sort of Wall Street. Sort of understanding of regulation and just how the real world actually operates on the Dungeons and Dragons. And, and that was what I think attracted us um, to invest in them. And, and actually, they've become since then a sort of preeminent uh, market data source for institutional traders. And it's you know, no secret that a lot of these big institutions, and I'm sure some of them are here tonight are actually testing and learning and trading this stuff. So it's not happening just at the sort of merchant or consumer level. You're actually starting to see big institutions 
trading cryptocurrencies. Right. So, so you know, Aaron, and that, and that we get into taxes. How, how do we, how do we move from a trading environment? And I think we all can agree if Bitcoin twenty years from now is just something that a bunch of commodities traders are slinging around. It's probably not going to be successful. You know, how do we make it well, mainstream? I would disagree I think, with that. Um, why? Well, first of all, I can answer. Let me go back. First of all, I don't. It's, it's not a, a zero sum game. Zero sum game concept in, in traditional risk management markets, in futures markets. If I win, you lose, you win, and I lose. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. These are not risk management price discovery tools. These are tools where value is traded. That's not, that's not a zero sum game market. I think I entirely agree. Um, however, I think the main point that we're missing is that the internet was really built wrong for finance. Um, yeah. When it was built, it was built to transmit data. And when we said, oh, maybe there's going to be flaws in the security of that data, we looked at SSL profiles and all these other architectures that we could build on top of the internet. So that's why the double and the triple report, that's why that was such a huge innovation to allow this, and it couldn't have gone forward without that. Right. Correct. I mean, that had, to, that had to exist before we kind of realized that we were doing the wrong thing. And in, in, in case in point, you look at March of this year, we had SSL hardly every single bank slash every single major institution was changing its SSL protocols. Um, this is because SSL was not thought out. Uh, Bitcoin was thought out with the, re with the reasoning of, of being transmittable money behind it and not the other way around. And I think that is the main determining factor that's going to actually contribute to as, and, and Aaron, I think it's it's broader than just you know trading of money. It's trading of actually anything. I mean, why does it take? Yeah, I mean, why does it take T plus three to settle a fixed income trade? I mean, that's just nonsense. And it's because it's built on batch. It all systems that were built before I was born. It'll eventually take five milliseconds. Yeah. And you know, and one of, one of the investments that I funded is uh, called Armory Technologies, and we build. We've built this most secure Bitcoin wallet. We've innovated uh, what's considered cold storage, uh, multi-signature cold storage. So can you, can you go through some of those concepts uh, quickly? Yeah, so when, you're, when you want to secure your data, you want to be able to uh, reduce the attack vector. And so we, we have it where you can manage everything with your wallet on a computer that touches the internet and talks to this blockchain. But when you actually want to sign the transaction, when you want to, when you want to use that that number that secures the data, that's on a computer that's never touched the internet, and so it's very easy to secure that, as opposed to trying to secure your 76 million uh, customer information or accounts or or Home Depot or Target or whoever, you know. With you, we, I mean, you can run our software on a rot on a Raspberry Pi that costs 35 dollars, and it's like as long as you've got that secured, uh, that Raspberry Pi secured, like your Bitcoins are, are protected by the by technology that the U.S. government uses to protect top secret and classified information. Uh, so we we developed the cold storage, then we developed uh, what are called hierarchical deterministic wallets, uh, Bit32, and that's where you're able to use a single backup, and from that you you can derive basically an infinite number of keys. And then, uh, and, and we'll be able to, you'll be able to do that across your entire organizations, like from that one root seed. And then we also innovated what's called the multi-signature. And so that's where instead of just one number protecting the Bitcoin, you can actually have the protocol recognize that it requires, say, five of seven signatures. So now we've got segregation of duties uh, in corporate governance being built into this. So that one guy in Japan can just run off with your five hundred million dollars, or or you know they got lost or they got hacked. But the problem is, is you can't prove whether they got hacked, whether they got lost, whether they got absconded with, whether you inadvertently sent them to an address you can't get the coins out of. You can't prove any of that. So we just have to rely on the map. So so I think a, a big question here is, you know, based on all these tech technology innovations. What what does that do to the price? You know, what, what how how is Bitcoin priced now? Is this is there a floor on Bitcoin because of all this technology underlying it? You know, we did a, a back of the napkin calculation today. You know, if you view Bitcoin as gold, and the same value of gold, of gold in the world, Bitcoin, it'll be worth five hundred thousand dollars. 
in, in US dollars, today's terms, and four million dollars if it was the value of every currency in the world. So it's four, so how about oil? Two million five hundred fifty-five thousand fifty cents. First of all, how many people in here have Bitcoin accounts or wallets? Me too. I I figured I need to understand this, so I I bought on exchanges. I have I have actually several wallets, bought on several different exchanges because I wanted to do this. Um, and I'm going to answer one of your questions about why I think this is important for commodities traders to be involved in this and why I think that is going to continue. One of the, the prime reasons for commodities exchanges in the first place, go back to 1848 in Chicago, they address price volatility. That's what, that's what those exchanges do. We have our first exchange, now this is a swaps exchange. In my mind, what is that price? It, prices it doesn't price the value of the commodity, the underlying, not the Bitcoin, the price of the price of the swap. I don't think it's going to be very long before we have a designated contract market in Bitcoin that would be regulated by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission that retail participants can trade on. And what that will do will narrow the bid-ask spread dramatically because there will be just like in any other commodity that we have ever seen in this world. And by the way, the first of these exchanges go back to 1470 and the rice exchange. You can let it show them. The concept applies to anything. And it applies to Bitcoin just like it applies to rice and corn I, and wheat and interest rates. And it will happen. I do think, though, that we need some more institutional participation as well. Strips and Long term, long term. That's, 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 that is, I, I believe that's correct too. I will say that the regulators are behind. We're, I think probably everybody in this room is. Um, but just in July of this year, uh, FinCEN issued another. They called it a technical release. And what they did was sort of flag that we're looking at SARS, looking at a lot of SARS, suspicious activity reports. So that means people, they're, they're getting very interested in this. At the same time, you have, I think, sort of more rational, but the, the Security and Exchange Commission is really not getting involved in this, except to look at people who are issuing unregistered IDOs and weeds and birds. But the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, they will be designating contract markets just as, as they've already done it. For, for stocks execution facilities. That's not in the distant future. And they're already in the pipeline. So you will have retail participants and institutional investors on both of those, and, and they go hand in hand. They don't work with one without the other. Uh, we'll, we'll take questions afterwards. So, um, so oh, Aaron, oh, is there a uh, floor on the price of Bitcoin? You know, I was in, I was in Aaron's office uh, a few months ago, and we talked about this Bitcoin is around $500. And we talked about, well, there's a certain price to mine gold. So it makes sense that gold can't go down to a dollar because it's, it costs $500 $800 an ounce just to mine one ounce of it. So is there similar economics here? And is that a good way of looking at, uh, from an investment standpoint, uh, you know, where Bitcoin prices are, are going and headed? I, I'd say there is no floor in any market that is actively traded. Um, however, I think there are significant forces that create a um, reasonable trade bottom for, for Bitcoin, and mainly it's the cost of mining and the uh, mining algorithm, which is, most people are unaware of this, the um, actual computational solution to Bitcoin is very computationally intensive. And it only gets more computationally intensive as more people attempt to mine it. So this equation will continually be going up as long as there are more people attempting to um, mine the asset. Eventually, it might have a cap if people decide it's not a mineable um, asset. But as that number goes up, which it only only has gone up, it never really for any period of time come down. Um, as that number increases, there the, the amount of power that you pay for one bitcoin production will increase. And I can say that for certain. But Aaron, the, the hash rate has increased something like 200 times in the last year. So <coughs> the largest supercomputer that's ever existed. Yeah, I mean, that's so, again, I hadn't thought of it quite like that. That's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, but, but I mean, is that, is that one of the reasons that the price has 
of that. Right, maybe Trace, you want to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I've been around it a long time, you know? <laughs> I've, I've ridden every roller coaster that I've been on. Uh, with eBay is a two sided network of that. Merchants, consumers. Bitcoin's a seven sided network. Right? We got speculators, we got merchants, we got consumers, we got the security, which is the hash rate. And that's why you trust this blockchain as opposed to a different blockchain. That incentivizes developers to build out the applications on it. Then we get financialization, like the swaps. And then we get what I like to call liquidity, or world reserve currency, or settlement currency status. Bitcoin is extensible with software, so we can actually build out more things. When Satoshi first uh, released it, there was no cold storage. Somebody had to build that which is what Alan Reiner innovated at Army. He built that. So as the developers come in, they make it more useful. Uh, gold, for example, is a, is a particular atom, and we have different uses or applications of gold. One of them is currency, but it could be a dental filling or something else. Bitcoin, which is really a precious number in this new digital commodity, it has many potential applications. Uh, I would say thousands of applications when you look at our entire uh, stack that we use in the internet. And currency is just one of those applications. Uh, if it were to, like offshore uh, offshore bank accounts, for example, you move 1% of offshore bank accounts into Bitcoin, and with civil forfeiture out there, it would be, they couldn't be seized, that you could use to, to defend yourself when all your assets get seized, and sometimes they get seized when they're completely innocent. Uh, Bitcoin could serve a role like that. Offshore, at, you know, 1% of offshore assets you're going to move the Bitcoin price to $2.8 million a coin. This, you know, this brings up a good point. I mean, point. it's just, th this could be the largest bull market ever in the history of humanity. And just to put it in perspective, when I started, when, when I started recommending it, you know, Warren Buffett said it's a mirage. When I started recommending it at a nickel, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway has returned 140,000% over the last 35 years. Bitcoin's up about 300,000% in three years. That's the scoreboard. And the potential scoreboard is orders of magnitude larger than that. So, so this, is, this, is a, this is a good segue. Um, so just to play the devil's advocate here, um, you know, there's a very well-known New York Times columnist, we won't mention his name. Uh, so he famously said, and this is, you know, Warren Buffett, I was going to get to that in a few minutes as well, there's a lot of haters on Bitcoin. Right? So just to have both sides of the argument here, you know, he said Bitcoin is evil, and these are his words, not mine. Uh, he coined it the long crypto con. Uh, and so he was arguing that you know, Bitcoin's worthless because there's no stable store of value like there is with US dollars. So th th you know, does, that, does that make sense economically? Could you see where someone could argue how Bitcoin is worthless because it's not banked by, uh, backed by a central bank, and uh, maybe Aaron, you want to take that? Well, my question is, what was Warren's last big tech purchase? It's not really worth doing one. I'm asking you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, you know, with that being said, you know, it's not a leader in our field. We really well, what we're talking about, we're talking about New York Times columnists here, not Warren Buffett. Oh, okay. Um, Warren Buffett, I. Warren Buffett's a re very wealthy man. We can't oh, yeah. hate on Warren Buffett. I think he's, he's <laughs> amazing for himself, but it's, uh, I think he's a little bit less educated than someone who would want to really understand Bitcoin. He's got a lot of other things on his plate. Right, but you know, it, it, you know, comparing Bitcoin for people looking at it from an investment perspective versus investing in a, a currency or a dollar, you know, how do they compare? You know, is there's obviously Bitcoin has a four or five billion dollar market cap, so. In the grand scheme of things, it's it's a very small part of the currency it's ecosystem. Not, and it's not easy. I think Mike, you're doing a good job of making it easier to invest in as a consumer. But it's not easy. You know, we um, had a bit of fun at the beginning of the year. We gave a thousand bucks to a couple of business school guys, and then we a thousand bucks to some guys with nothing in. So go live on that for ten days and tell us what it was like. How friction free was it? And it wasn't at all. It was actually a pain in the arse. And, and I think until the entrepreneurs and the developers figure out a way of making that more consumable and things, you know, products are hedgeable. Well, you know, Elizabeth, there's supposed to be an ETF called Coin uh, that the Winklevoss twins were going to put out. 
Um, so that would take us one step closer to getting a more retail-oriented product. So why isn't that going to happen? I or let's phrase that, I, is that going to happen? I, 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 think that, I, I think that this will, I think that this will happen. And again, you have to think about the definition of a commodity. Under the Commodity Exchange Act, it is incredibly broad. Any good, right, or service that a commodity can be traded in the future now or in the future, with the exception of onions and box office features. But you can trade in, you can, I can commoditize anything, an event, the weather, I can you trade you trade weather futures. I mean, is that weirder than than Bitcoin? The cool things. They, yeah. <laughs> Good. But you can trade on on default risk. Excuse me, we, we're very familiar with that. We're very very familiar with trading on default risk. How much stranger is that than Bitcoin? It seems to me that Bitcoin actually has more more of more of a grounding to it. I, I get that. I, mean, I can look at my wallet, my Bitcoin wallet. There's something there. There is a commodity there. So when we're talking about exchanging values, it's the value that we assign to it. And you mentioned futures exchanges on, on Bitcoin. Under because, well, yeah, you might want to. I'm putting my business cards right here. Want, under the Commodity Exchange Act, there is a requirement that it, there is exclusive jurisdiction over products traded, futures and options on commodities traded in, your, in interstate commerce. They are required to be traded on 4A under a designated contract market. Otherwise, they're really so there is a process that has to be endured, and again, we don't worry through that. But it can be done, and it's going to happen. Absolutely, and 100% it's going to happen. And I think that is a public good. I think that's a, that's a good thing that's going to happen. Maybe we should nominate you for SEC. Well, <laughs> no, no I, it, I mean, I, 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 I firmly believe that that's the, the way this is happening, and it should happen that is way. It, is it going to happen? Here, or is it going to happen in another country in another jurisdiction under a different set of regulations? I pray to God it happens here. Because at the moment, you've got other countries that are figuring this stuff out. But so that, that brings up a good point, uh, Gareth and uh, Trace. Maybe you want to talk about this. I think, you know, regulatory I, I, I think you no, know, in now we're here in, in the, uh, the the UK consulate. Yes, Her Majesty is. Is that, is that the proper term? I'm sorry. Okay. I, mean, I, was just, uh, I was just in London so I, talking about this. I don't get the feeling that it's in there. Well, I, I think you know the, the Bank of England has put out not one but two different white papers on Bitcoin. Do you guys feel like there's more education and more of an appetite for this in Europe, uh, in Scandinavia, and other places you know, outside of the U.S.? <coughs> Uh, yeah, so another one of the companies I invest, I, I've invested in is it's called Gold Money, and we take physical delivery of physical gold for customers, and then we put it on our truck and take it to a vault. We've recently spun off another company, which would have been in the U.S., but instead it's in the Isle of Man uh, because of the regulatory environment, and we actually make a spot market between gold, Bitcoin, and British pounds. And so that's a, a very interesting exchange. Um, because when we look at the history of money, we got gold, which is not extensible. It doesn't change, but it's still limited in amount. Then we've got fiat currency, which is extensible, and we can abstract on it with swaps and derivatives and all types of very, uh, a lot of financial engineering. Which is pretty bad history. Um, which has bad history. But, but that history might be because it's not limited in amount. We can just control, print trillions of these units, right? Which is fine. This is so good. But, this is so much better than fiat currency. But Bitcoin is both extensible and limited in amount. And we're, if we can build into the protocol leverage ratios for insurance contracts or collateralization, or we can abstract on top of it ownership of different assets like a representation of shares, and then you have them atomically trade in the blockchain, instant settlement, no counterparty risk, you're not relying on things like the DTCC, you know exactly 
you'll be able to know exactly who owns what, which I think with hypothecation and rehypothecation and how how institutions like MF Global uh, have abused customer segregated assets, it's nice to know exactly where the assets are and who holds the private keys to those assets. And Bitcoin enables that to happen. So, you know, Aaron and, and Gareth, I'll let you take this one. There's been about $400 million by, by our calculation put into Bitcoin startups over the last few years. Um, for, you know, a relatively nascent industry, a four $5 billion market cap, as, as we said, it, it was that, is that a right amount? Is that too little, too much? You know, are you concerned, Gareth, about the regulatory environment that one day you're not even going to, to do anything with Bitcoin anymore and the companies are all, all going to have business? No, I mean, I think, well, Andreessen, I think, said that it's, you know, it's a typical VC investment because zero should be, you know, was it two billion, two million of Bitcoin? Four million. We have no Four idea million. where this could be. Right, I mean, but that's, you know, so I mean, it's definitely, you know, from a venture perspective, an investable space. Um, it's 250, 400 million. I mean, the numbers are different depending on who you speak to, but it's a lot. Relatively, I think we saw Coinbase. Sorry, uh, blockchain out of the UK just raised 30 million, which I think is the largest Series A that's ever been raised. Um, so I definitely think there's, you know, maybe some hype in the space, but regulatory worries. I'm actually more interested in the arbitrage opportunities. I do think that, and that's why, you know, candidly, I'm spending a bit of time in London because at the moment I think. They are friendlier and perhaps, you know, they're friendly and a respected regime. They always have been from a regulatory perspective. And maybe that is a natural place for some of these businesses to land. And um, I should be paying attention to that. Um, I think when you look at uh, how foreign currency markets played out, uh, that they are very resistant to uh, centralized control because of how many places you can trade it in and how many uh, factors can all of those things as an aggregate. And if you decide to regulate it in a really heavy, heavy ways, you're definitely going to be left out of that support, which would cause a huge... I, 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 mean, I, yeah, I mean, I do sense, and I, I didn't pay enough attention at school to be uh, a lawyer, um, but I do, I do sense that there's, there's a different, you know, that there's more of a, an appetite to kind of lock people up here for mucking around in Bitcoin than there are in certain, I know it's a very layman's perspective, but I definitely feel that there's, you know, it's a trickier environment to manage and navigate through here than it is in other parts of the world. But for an innovation perspective, which is where we really are in this phase of in Bitcoin and distributed nature, I think we're in this phase of testing and learning. And I think we need an environment that's going to allow that to happen. I mean, outside of Bitcoin, you look at the UK and they've allowed, you know, even my mum and dad, just general people in the street, to invest fifteen thousand pounds of their own money, capital gains tax-free, into tech-enabled lenders. It appears to be a lending platform. It's those types of regulatory environments which I think actually the blockchain and Bitcoin needs, rather than the complexity of some of the stuff that we've had to navigate through tonight. Well, and you know, we've seen a lot of. Uh, Adoption of Bitcoin in the last few weeks, you know, PayPal and different merchants. You know, but I'm going to pose a, a counter question: Is that could that actually be considered as negative? Is that actually driving down the price of Bitcoin? Is, you know, is do we need you know for every cell, you know, people are just converting. You're buying your iPad and converting it into dollars. That's great. Doesn't that defeat the whole purpose of having a, a Bitcoin economy? Aaron or her trace? More philosophical question. I, I think it's great because when you look at the subjective value theory, uh, you know, somebody values the beer more than they value the Bitcoin, but the person who traded the beer, uh, they value the Bitcoin more than they value the beer. So that trade, when it's consensual, actually leaves both parties better off. And, you know, as long as you're, you're trading the Bitcoins in a relatively free market like that, I mean, it's very great for increasing the standard of living for all of them. Isn't there eventually going to have to be someone who just prices everything in Bitcoin? So why do you convert it to dollars? Well, I think, I think the, the evolution of Bitcoin becoming a numerator is, that's probably, 
decade or too long. I mean, this is a very, I mean, we're talking about a, a new innovation here. It's a new protocol layer on the internet. We have HTTP, TCP IP, we have SMTP for email. Uh, this is a new protocol layer of the internet for traditional value. And uh, just like we like, we, we provided a regulatory regime in the U.S. with like the Communications and Decency Act to keep third parties uh, from being liable for what people posted on their site. That enabled companies like Facebook and eBay and Amazon. Uh, so likewise, if, if the U.S. drives innovation out because of the regulatory climate, I think that's going to leave a big hole from a national security standpoint because you know, Facebook and you know, things like that are very helpful for well, that, That's a good point. You know, talking about national security, you know, you know, there's been a lot of stuff happening with China and Russia. In fact, we wrote a, a blog post a few months ago. It got 20,000 hits in 24 hours. And it was called Vladimir Putin, the world's largest Bitcoin investor. Because if you, you know, the way I look at the world, we have the U.S. and then we have a black country, block of countries that will do anything in their power to stick a finger in the eye of the U.S. So, you know, are there potential inter, you know, international power play, political things at stake here? You know, in addition to just you know economics and, and merchants. Well, yeah, that's the last part of the point I wanted to make. The largest Bitcoin exchange is in the U.K. It's in. Uh, you have another big one, BTCEs in Russia. You've got the Chinese exchanges, which are in Hong Kong and Singapore. They're very large. The U.S. is not a player in the Bitcoin exchange market. I mean, like the the, the bit license and stuff. I mean, I don't know who they think they're going to get to like come into business here, uh, because everybody who's like a player in the Bitcoin market is already doing business in a different jurisdiction. Like the U.S. is beginning to have to like, catch up to get the innovation to come back. And I think that's a, a tough position to be in, and you're going to lose your technological lead because the entire internet is going to have to be creatively destroyed to apply blockchain technology to it. So Elizabeth, can you cover the uh, Ben Wosky? Who, by the way, is doing a event at the same exact time as this event tonight? Let me, let me posit this. When people talk about regulation, they want all regulation together as number one bad thing and number two all the same. And there is a very difference, there is, there is a difference in kind of regulation by the CFTC, regulation by the SEC, and regulation by the banking regulators. The CFTC is what's called a policies-based regulator. They, they moved after 2000, after the CFNA, from being a prescriptive-based to a principles-based policies-based regulators. So they don't have, or to open up a futures exchange, there's not a long set of prescriptive rules. You have to have this, 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 this in your rule book. There are 23 what are called core principles. And you have to, to open up a futures exchange and big one, you say, I comply with all of these core principles. Here how, here's how I do it. It's a lighter regulatory touch, much lighter than the SEC, much lighter than, for example, prudential regulators that come in and audit you. That's why I think, if I'm looking at this regulatory spectrum, the CFTC has, for some very obvious and good reasons, the reputation of a lighter regulatory touch. And, in addition, this price volatility that you've mentioned a couple of times, the whole point of futures exchanges is to, to discover the true economic price of a commodity. And the world we're talking about, what's the price of Bitcoin? When you have buyers and sellers and hedgers, and hedgers, that's, a, that's another huge piece of this. That's a, that's a, that's a fantastic area for growth here. And right now, there's no place for them to do that. No, no centralized marketplace. That's why, as I said, I, I quote that a futures exchange starts here in the United States. And I happen to know the CFTC is open to this. So I'm hoping that somebody is going to not be so scared of the, you know, the big bad regulator. Because that's not what the CFTC is in this area. This isn't, this isn't I mean, I know, 
lived there for 25 years. This is a place that they, they are actually open to innovation. And I think it is a good way to counter, for example, DOJ and FinCEN, who are very clearly making these, we don't know what's going on out there, so we're sending out, we're filing the SARS reports. If you have another federal regulator, if you have a federal regulatory agency that says, we've got an exchange, we've got a register on that we're, that we're overseeing here, and it's working, and they're under federal regulatory oversight, and by golly, people aren't defrauding other people on it. There is a natural sense of, oh, well, we can back off of it. And I think that's, that's in my mind, for the United States, that is the right way to go. So before we uh, take a QA, and a um, I want to get everybody in the panel's thought for one to two minutes. Um, you know, what's going to take Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general to the, to the next level? You know, what is the next one, two, three, four, five years look like? You know, how do you get there in terms of adoption, making the, the price more stable? You know, what are the steps that we need to take? And are we going to be sitting here 50 years from now and talking about Bitcoin like we do anything else, and it's not going to be a big deal. So I'll I'll start with you, Aaron. Um, yeah, I, I think we will be seeing uh, Bitcoin on our tickers in 50 years. Um, if it's not Bitcoin, it'll be something that's exactly like Bitcoin, but a little bit better. But I seriously doubt that the trajectory that it will be, um, because of how committed the developers are to changing things, including things that they actually need to be. Um, I'm not going to make price predictions, but I can see it answering a lot of the problems with interest rates and um, uh, dilution of the you know, markets that we already can clearly see today. Right, so Trace, what is, what is the next few years in the Bitcoin market look like? Because we've grown exponentially just in the last two years, so 2016, what are we going to be talking about? Yeah, I think we're going to see just a lot more consumer adoption of it. We've had the speculators are pretty much, you know, we've got good network effects in the speculators. Our merchants are coming on board. Dell, Overstock, CEO of Overstock wants hedging. Uh, other other merchants are gonna have to accept it. I mean, is Amazon gonna see 200 countries to Overstock? Because Overstock can take payment from 200 countries and we can like export a lot of goods. Is, is Amazon just gonna not even compete in those markets. I mean, so I think we're going to see a lot more merchants just have to accept it in order to take payment because most of these countries you can't get credit cards. And when you can, like, what are the profit percentages? It's like 30% for most for your average transactions in that Africa. So, uh, but you take Bitcoin, there's no fraud, there's no chargeback. It's as good as, like, you know it's there, right? In the right when it's in. So I think we're going to see merchants and consumer adoption uh, network effects be taking place. And then you know, a little bit further down the line, we're going to be seeing more of this financialization and the developers building out and extensifying Bitcoin. Uh, 50 years from now, uh, I, I like Bill Lurie of the web he, he put out, you know, you look at a million dollar Bitcoin and like what's the percentage of that, so our discounted future value of Bitcoin. Because I think Bitcoin's very binary, it's either going to be huge or it's going to be nothing. And so, like in 50 years, we're looking, and the market's already discounted like less than a fraction of a percent. So I think the market's pretty wide as it kind of determines the prices, so I'm pretty much agree with that. And Elizabeth, when are we... Nice to a little bit of it, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> when are we going to see this ETF and these futures contracts that you talk about? I don't want to look at 50 years. I want to look at 2015. And I don't, I don't see in, in my crowd, I don't talk to any other lawyers who talk like this. Um, I, I kind of look at myself as, as the the Snow White in the legal industry at Bitcoin. Um, get it, miners? <laughs> and I, and I, I want to help people who are bashful or sleepy or dopey or grumpy or, you know. I want people to be doc and happy. I'm, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> I mean, I really would like to get somebody in front of the CFTC and say, here's the futures exchange, because I know they will be receptive to it. And I know it's going to be 
sooner rather than later. It's just going to have to follow the process that, that number one, Congress has said you have to follow, because otherwise, then it's going to tank. If that doesn't happen, then it's going to tank. But I know there are people out there who have this in their mind. I, I, I can do a futures exchange in this. I know that. They just have to find the right people to lead them down the path. And that's what I'm going to do. Cool. So you're, yeah, they're, you're the uh, Bitcoin I leader. Miss, I miss no way. Uh, so, so Gareth, you know, in terms of the, the VC angel side, how do you see things playing out for the, the next few years? So I'm not even see an IPO of a, a Bitcoin company in I don't know, two I years. Think, I think what's um, been a revelation for me, and I've been you know, investing now for a couple of years um, you know, in financial services tech, specifically in a little bit uh, in the Bitcoin space, as I said earlier, but um, I see a lot of businesses and business plans across my desk from all over the world and I have to say that is hugely encouraging but I don't think it's going to be or I'm not necessarily interested in the price becoming whatever it's going to be a lot I'm more interested in the entrepreneur that's going to develop some capabilities on top of the blockchain that for me is the fundamental disruptive capability that we've got you know, in front of us now and it's going to be fascinating to see these smart guys and girls who are going out and building really useful kit to sort of talk about. That's, that's where I get really terribly excited. Awesome. So if there are any in, in the audience. So we're going to take about 10 to 15 minutes of questions.